Welcome, Agile Loungers and Agile Lovers, to the Dare Real Agile Podcast, where your host here, Coach AF. Yes, I'm Coach As Fuck, because it's my initial. And today, we are going to have a nice, real, authentic conversation with Mr. Daniel Mizig that I really appreciate in my network. We didn't meet in person yet, Daniel, right? That's correct. But we've been watching us, and of course, my late mentor, uh, talked highly of you. I'm talking about Mike Beadle here. So it's the one responsible yeah. to bring us together at some point, even after almost three years that he's uh, not part of this world. So exactly that was my, yes, Mike Beadle and Ken Schreiber. Actually, I should have bring it with me. That's the first book on Scrum I read when I started being a Scrum. Ever. 19, yep, 1996, right? Exactly. But me, it was 1999, unfortunately. I came a bit late, but... Um, I, I, I could say that I'm agile, lean thinking and scrum since the turn of the century. And ever since then, I'm really passionate about helping people, inviting them to agility and so on. So uh, I would like just to, for my audience, both on YouTube, uh, Spotify and Apple podcasts, just to, um, one thing that I love from you, it's that you contribute to the agile community as a large with three books, and one of them is Inviting Leadership. It's an invitation-based change, and I hope that in the course of your conversation, you're gonna talk about your three books and how do you been introduce yourself to Agile and so on. So, so this is uh, it actually, uh, for those on YouTube, guys, you could actually go to uh, the website here. I'm gonna put the link in the description for all my audience to go, but it's a very interesting and exciting thing. Uh, and I think you are, uh, as you mentioned here, enabling enterprise agility. But again, tell tell us first who you are and uh, what you actually um, like to show up in the world of daring, agile, the real agile uh, type of thing. So who you are, Daniel? Who am I? Yeah, so uh, I am Daniel Mezik, and I'm reaching you and interacting here from my undisclosed location in North Guilford, Connecticut, USA. So that's who I am and where I am. Uh, I'm in the beginning of probably the last third of my life and I have older kids. My, my, my uh, firstborn is 36 years old and my uh, fourth child is 24. So uh, our four kids uh, live around here and they have children and you know, that's who I am. So professionally, I've been busy with Agile stuff since 2006 or so. But I first heard about it in 1997 when I was teaching at a place called IDX. I was teaching Microsoft platforms and tools. Uh, they became GE, uh, got consumed by GE Healthcare. Oh, yeah. Wow. And uh Jeff, Jeff Sutherland was there and the people were murmuring about, you know, what he was making them do, you know, this daily scrum, we have to answer these three stupid questions, blah, 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 you know. So I heard the noises as he was developing scrum in the 96, 97 timeframe as a CTO at, I, at IDX. Uh, but I was too busy with my own work to really pay too much attention to it. So I I just had my head down. I was delivering training there. And then, you know, a whole bunch of things happened. Suddenly I landed in 2006 and I went to a CSM class with a guy named Lowell Lindstrom in Chicago. Oh, yeah. And that was the beginning of, yeah, that's the beginning of my story. Okay, so where you're from? And then I immediately Chicago. started going. You were from Chicago? No, I'm not from Chicago. No, I'm from, I'm from New England. I, I was raised in Massachusetts. I live in Connecticut now. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that's nice. So but um, yeah. I should probably tell you, if you want to know the, my Agile origin story, uh, you know, that's it. And then my story about employee engagement and often participation, human agency, uh, fundamental respect for the people affected by the change, that I could tell you that story. I can, I can actually give you a date and everything. You want to know the story about that? Yes, because that's one of the big thing after 20 years of the Agile Actually, I should say the manifesto for agile software development and then the, the yeah. smaller of us bring it to the entire enterprise with what we call business agility. And now all of a sudden, our industry great buzzword and we seem to forget about the people first. You know? And as you said, like how they react to change, whether it's they adopting the agile mindset or not, 
So I'd like to hear about this to link it because for me, I'm connecting the dot of, on everything that's around this movement of agility. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's, there's what's happening is the defined process is being used to implement empirical process. It's actually kind of stupid, right? I mean, when I say it, it sounds so obvious, but look, there's two classes of people that are doing this work. The ignorant people who don't know any better and think they're doing great work, like I thought I was back in 2010. I'm going to tell you the story in a minute. And then there's the other type that know exactly what they're doing um, and that they're basically, that there's not going to be a transformation. There's just going to be a, a really large set of transactions, right? And the transformation is going to vaporize after a while, but the transactions are forever, right? So there's that, there's that going on across the industry as well. So there's, there's two classes of, of people that are involved here. In 2010, I thought I was doing almost perfect work. I uh, was in a client at eight or nine teams. I was there for uh, three months, two or three days a week. That's what I told my sponsor. I could reasonably, uh, that if he used me that much or that little, he could get what he wanted. So there was an end date to the thing, and we both agreed uh, the end date would be three months from the start date. And I, you know, I thought that was an interesting way to get people moving as well to let them know, hey, I'm leaving. You're going to have to learn how to do this yourself. Here, let me teach you some of it. You know, to the executives, the the the, the directors, the managers, the teams, everybody, they should know that Elvis is going to leave the building, right? I mean, you're going to have to do this on your own at some point. Yeah. So we did that, and and we 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 rolled out Agile and Scrum. Uh, and some Kanban, and I thought I was doing great. I was there about five weeks, six weeks in, so I was almost halfway through my engagement there. I thought things were going great. Went out to lunch one day, one summer day, and I came back, um, and I was washing my hands in the men's room. No one else was in there. I'm washing my hands. I'm looking in the mirror. The, you know, the whole wall is one big mirror. There's four, there's four sinks there. And this guy walks in, uh, this guy, Anatoly. Anatoly was a uh, Russian uh, software architect. Okay, so he was very smart uh, and a true software engineer, and he had done a lot of the designs and stuff. And I knew, I'm pretty sure his IQ was quite a bit higher than mine. And he comes in, and I'm washing my hands, and he comes in, he starts washing his hands. I say, hey, Anatoly, how's it going? How are you doing? How, what's going on with you today? And he looks at me through the mirror, you know, and he goes, oh, he goes, you want to know how I am doing today. Uh -huh. I'm like, yeah, yeah, how are you? And he goes, just like this. Agile sucks and so do you. Whoa. Just like that. I looked in the mirror, my face got really red. And I said, well, what's the reason? Like, what, what's that? Where's that coming from? Tell me more. He goes, nobody gives a shit what I think or what I feel about this change that we have made. I have ideas. I had ideas. I'm not even willing to share them now. I'm so disgusted with this. So Agile sucks, Daniel, and so do you. And then he took his paper towel and he balled it into a very tight ball and he very precisely flung it in the trash and then he said so daniel have a very nice day goodbye and he walked out and i was there alone looking in the mirror with my face all red with a big wtf on my forehead mm -hmm. and that was the beginning of my enlightenment Ah, enlightenment or oh, awakening, <laughs> shall we say? I thought I was doing perfect work. And many of your listeners probably think they're doing perfect work. Oh, yeah. But if it's not the team's idea to work in this way, you're not going to get any good results. No. And, but this yeah, is I mean, you, you'll, right? Because, um, yeah, I had some similar discussion. Actually, I've been introduced to Scrum by a group of engineers that they wanted to do that system. And they asked me, I was only a customer experience manager back then. And of course the bosses, uh, they want me to be a, pro a project manager. And all of a sudden, okay. 
the engineer, the team says like, no, 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 no. We want you to be the scrum master. And so I said like, what, what? a Toastmaster? I don't know that. Anyway, so that's, so that's why I grabbed the book of Ken Schrauber and Mike Beadle that you show earlier uh, about agile software development. And, I, and we, we get into some coffee and stuff. So me, I had it rough because I've got some Antonoli asking me to do a system to ease their life and to actually educate the business. Well, that's a different story. Yeah. And, but for that's you, that's a good. That's a good way to go. Yeah. So, th so that's why probably me, even if I'm not part from the development uh, teams or IT, I kind of built my empathy towards putting people first and how do they want to actually produce and really the, these principles of self-organized team and engagement. But maybe you're gonna talk about it later, uh, and you're gonna. No, let's talk about it now. Let's, yeah. let's talk about it now. Let's talk about let's talk about self organization for two minutes. Okay, here's what I think about this. Because I, I first of all, too much fluffy about this, and I'd like to have the real thing. Yeah, let's just let's just let's just get right into it. Right? Okay. So, self organization shows up in the manifesto. Self organizing teams are the source of all these great things. Okay. Birds flock. People get into mobs and crowds. Fish school. This is the self organization in those groups. But that's not what we're talking about, actually. What we're actually talking about is um, self-organization within the context, goal-seeking organization that's looking to make a profit by delivering something of value to customers. Yeah. Okay. So that's the context. Okay. It's not. The, it's not the nature. It's not the sky. It's not the ocean. It's not mobs or crowds. It's goal-seeking organizations with teams that are have a sub goal and when they're all moving pr presumably in a direction to produce something that costs less than they sell it for so that everyone can make a living and, 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 and thrive and, and so forth. Right. That's yeah. what it's about. All right. So okay. self-organization, go ahead, go ahead. The purpose of business. I mean, you don't have any business. Business. Customer or satisfy it's a business. Exactly. So. It's a business context. Okay, so self-organization in a business context is self-management, where people manage themselves. Now, what are they managing? This is a punchline. What are they managing when they're self-managing? Answer, they are managing decisions that affect that group, that team, that team of teams, that enterprise, okay? So... What you're really managing in self-management is decisions that affect everyone's work. So at the team level, if we're self-managed team, then we are good at managing our own decisions at our level of scope regarding how we work. Okay, so it's all about decisions. It's all about the management of decisions. So when I hear blah, 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 self-organization, blah, 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 I... I macro substitute self-management of decisions because that's what's really going on. Well, for me, this okay. is self-management. Exactly. Because, and it always made me what inspired me of being, becoming a greater version of consultant and agile coach to help those team thrive is I always question like the C-level suite. I said like, excuse me, but you hire an Antonelli, like you, you spoke before, big enterprise architect and stuff. And he told you in the, in, in, the, in the bathroom, oh, I had ideas, but nobody's listening. Nobody pay attention. No so, one even asked them. Exactly. So that's, that's for me. I think it was Steve Jobs in an interview who talked about like, if you hire people for their skills, talent, and their knowledge, let them do it. So when I built the team, I said like, hold on a second. You have these engineer or these uh, great designer and people, and you try to order them and come in and control and classic when you say you are doing scrum, you're not doing scrum because for me, self-organized team is having the trust for them to put decision. Exactly. Yes. Oh, yes. This is Stacy. For, for your listeners or our viewers who don't know, this is a Stacy complexity graph. So, here is perfect agreement and perfect certainty. Here we're far from certainty and here we're far from agreement. Up here we have no agreement and no certainty whatsoever, okay? Yeah. So this is a boring this is a boring zone down here. Yeah. This is the agile space where you're at near this line. You're either in chaos or near the edge of it. 
Awesome. You're certainly on this side. You're on this side of the red. You're inside the red area, okay? So when you're in this space, you have to basically delegate decision-making authority to the edge. Exactly. exactly. That's it. Yeah. Down here, down here, everyone knows the process. There's no decisions to make at all. Just follow the steps, right? And here is a hybrid space, but you know. And this is what but we the want bottom to line is, go ahead. Is that it? The, the, Say it again. The goal in decision making, we want to be in the hybrid space of your graph. And for my listener, we'll put some. In the, hybrid, in the hybrid area, we're not like, look, if you have an agile project and you're up here, you know, Ken Schwab's first site was called controlchaos.com. You know that. Okay. When you're up here, what we're trying to do is we're trying to move the the project out of chaos and then into this middle area where we can where we have a grip on it okay up here you don't have a grip on anything that's where you have to actually let decisions happen now can i go a little further with this for just a moment be my guest please and um the bar i'm going to show you yeah i want to show you something here's a uh Yeah, this particular, uh, I'm just, uh, your, your readers just have to hold on for a minute because I'm, no I'm scrolling through so fast. Let me, let me. Listener of the podcast, just come and join us on our YouTube channel to see the visual what we share together because I know I have to adapt to my audience too. This is Agile, right? Because yeah, yeah. Check this out now. This is, this is from the U.S. military. The U.S. military says there's three gating factors. Are you sharing your screen right now? Okay. Oh, yeah. Good. yeah. Okay. Now we are. This is a three D. This is a three D diagram, right? So, so look. On the vertical, it's the pattern of interaction among the among the actors. Okay, that's one thing that you're going to try. You're going to throttle, from tightly constrained to the completely unconstrained. In the horizontal, the allocation of decision rights to uh, the edge either none or very broad. Okay, so that's that axis. And then this depth axis is the how the information among entities is distributed. These are the three things that you need to control and you need to loosen them up when there's a lot of chaos. So the green would be like the chaotic space. The white would be like the totally defined space on, on, uh, on this diagram, right? It's just another way of viewing it, all right? And what they're saying is these three gating factors matter the most, right? Number one, your patterns of interaction. Number two, the allocation of decision rights. This is like 90% of the problem with most companies. And then the, the last thing is the, 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 free, the free flow or the lack of flow of information mm -hmm. among the actors, okay? So up here is the agile space. Now, this whole thing I, is called... Uh, Agile C2, wow. C2, okay, C2, C2 is command and control. So this is Agile C2, C2 Agility. They're talking about, yeah, 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 yeah. So here's, yeah. so here's the link. Okay. Now what's really interesting about this is they're talking about leadership agility. When they say C2 Agility, They're talking about command agility. In other words, executive level agility. And guess what? Guess what the paper says? Here's the, here's the deeper, that was the overview. Here's the deeper paper for your listeners. Hey, guess what? You, you lose every endeavor if your leadership team doesn't have true agility in the leadership function. Exactly. You get to lose every time. That's what they say in the paper. Yeah. And so you And yeah. this is a big question sometimes because as an independent contractor with my team, because I've got other scrum master and, and coaches, and I'm going to say like, if you do business development to get a contract and people, uh, they're mostly calling us and they ask them in the, in the conversation, I make sure that they understand that kind of concept. Because if they said, oh no, we just want one of your team uh, to come in and teach us this and that. Of course, we could take some training um, or coaching or facilitation mandate, but if they want something more like an endeavor to really transform their business or their way to work together, 
if one of my coach or myself, we cannot access to the sea level and they cannot delegate, as you mentioned earlier, the part of this decision making to those teams of creative people, of production people. I said, what's right. the point of, you don't want to be agile, you want to do something that will use some kind of tools and technique. So um, I'm not hungry, so I said no to those clients and sometimes I fire them because what's the point? So yeah. yeah, there's other coaches that aren't you that can give them what they want, which is not what they need. So yeah, let someone else do it. Well, I don't remember the graph of a psychologist called uh, Ben Zenson, who was talking about the needs and wants. And then if you go into conscious leadership, transforming a manager into a leader, a leader in the C-suite, when you, because sometimes I work with executive coach and concordance to make sure they understand because there's no transformation of an organization to be more agile, that it's bottom, it's bottom up or top down. It's have to be both at the same time. You let the team organize themselves. I don't know what what's you're talking about. Yeah, Leah, let's talk about that for a minute. Bottom down, bottom up and top down. What that's usually referring to is the, at the bottom is the people with no authority to make a decision. Mm -hmm. At the top are people, a small subset of the total, who make the majority of global level decisions. Okay. So when we're talking about top down, bottom up, it's about the authority distribution schema. We sometimes call that the hierarchy of authority distribution. So when people say, oh, the hierarchy, they really mean the hierarchy of authority distribution. They're actually describing the authority distribution schema. Oh. Okay, that's what we're really talking about. So we're using very imprecise language in the agile space. People are just talking so much like, nonsense and wheel reinvention i mean all this stuff's been covered for like decades hundreds of years even I, I like that because every time i saw a paper on medium or even on linkedin linkedin is the worst linkedin is becoming the professional uh, twitter fight with politeness of, of bullshit yes there's bullshit everyone there's peddler everyone so i mean <clears throat> but for me wh wh why are we are so off uh, and people call me purists. Maybe you yourself. I don't know. Why? No, that's easy. No, no, no. It's easy to explain. Okay. Um, executives are people, and people oh. are suckers for a story that they want to hear, oh. or a story that they expect to hear, or a story that is coherent for them that fits their model of reality. So and when we show up, it, what's that? And so a story that will will benefit them, but who cares about their customer? Who cares about the employees or? Well, more specifically, a story that confirms their model of reality. Oh. Okay, so when you show up and talk about self-management, hey, first of all, that's going to be threatening to some people because after all, if I'm a manager and I hear self-management, I'm threatened by that. Okay. So there's that. Uh, so there's this fight flight thing that goes on, but more importantly, if I have a mechanistic model of the organization, if I believe the company is a kind of machine and I, and then you come to me and you sell with machine language, you know, you start talking about, for example, um, release trains those are machines right okay and then there's a release train engineer okay that's a machine operator okay so if we you know you come and sell me a mechanistic model of reality that's the one i have in my head i understand your language and i'm buying it you come in with self-management self-organization open space blah 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 Hey, you know what? That gets lost in translation and it doesn't match my model. So I don't know what the F you're talking about. But I think this is the biggest problem. In the world. Okay. But well, we talk about the fluffy language and people don't go into the deep. So, so you're telling me one of my um, appreciation of our industry, if we call it like this, is there's maybe something like 80% of consultants out there, whether individual or firms that are just using words that deliver things is it you said like probably it's because of these executive and we want to please them 
we want to be agreeable to them. So we're going to approach it into a process framework instead of the uh, living agility, if I could call it like this. No, and no we want to we want to make the sale. Yeah, of course we want to make the sale, but uh, besides you're not going to make. You know, hold on, you're not, you're not going to make a sale if your pitch gets lost in translation. I got you. You're going to lose the sale, and this explains all of the bullshit in the agile world today. Ah, so this is why the what you call as a term agile industrial complex back in the day, and I'd like to hear about this because uh, for me this yeah, is yeah. all together today because I was following you. And I love it. And even I use that term to express some ideas of, of, of people complexifying things. I remember a quote from Jim Ismith, one of the co-sanitary. He says, like, you want to be agile, keep it simple and, and, and clear. And people go away from it because they want to, as you said, sell. And to sell, they are agreeable. And they are not their true self. And just in Montreal, it's, an, it's an, the Montreal market here in Canada It's a nomogenistically approach of safe that I call sf because there's no it's far from being. <laughs> and and these guys, they talk to me in private. I won't name anybody here. Don't worry, guys. But a lot of those coaches with FCFC5 or whatever the terms is for the certification, they exactly told me that. Oh, we just want to please that market. But I said, like, our purpose as business agility coach, isn't it like to spark them and then blend them to create something greater than our ego and self. Maybe I'm too much, uh, I don't know. But for me, these guys are just creating this block of things. But in private, they told me, safe sucks. Safe is completely stupid. Safe is anti-agile and stuff. But oh, well, hold on a minute, hold on a minute, hold on a minute. Let's, let's talk about this for a minute, right? Yeah. Harrison Owen is like, uh, he's, a, my, he's a mentor and he's a friend, right? He's in his mid 80s now. Uh, he's the open space guy. Who's that? Because you know, I... Harrison Owen. Oh, yeah. Okay. You know him. Yeah. So he says all systems are open. And he also says that all systems are self-organizing. Okay. Um, so look, SAFE is playing some important role. And coherent stories about how we're going to do A and then B and then C and then D, that's playing some important role in this wide open thing. Mm. Okay. And here's what I think is going on. Okay. First of all, I have nothing against SAFE. I think SAFE has great potential uh, if it's implemented properly. But what I'm seeing is that it's routinely imposed on people without their consent. And I don't think that works. Okay. I've never seen it work long term at all. So if we took SAFE and we gave it to the people and said, what are we going to do with this? They would find a way to throw some things away, add some things, keep some things the same and make it work for them. Okay. Okay. And we'd have engaged people, right? I mean, look, this is what people do because all systems are open and all systems are self-organizing. So in that world, everything is perfect at any point in time. Even stuff like World War II, World War I, that stuff at the time, other things that were very bad that happened were fulfilling some role or function in the wider scheme of who we are and what we're doing as people. Okay, so what's, what I see happening, if we look at the results, here's what I see happening. Huge transactions inside companies, from, mostly from third-party consultants that have a brand. Okay, they're making millions upon millions on this stuff. That's the first thing that happens. Second thing that happens is they get some improvement, the, the client company, they get some improvement, some perceived improvement because they... Um, they're now paying attention and they're measuring things that they weren't measuring before. And they're doing some surface level process changes that are giving them a five or 10% bump in what they're measuring. The other thing that's happening is, and I think, by the way, I think that the five or 10% vaporizes and evaporates over time. Once the, once the consultants leave, the highly authoritative consultants leave, it, it just regresses back to what it was before. Yeah. But the biggest thing that's going on with these th these um, large scale so-called transformations is, and this is a really important thing I want your, your listeners to know. Oh, yes, me too. This is it. The top talent is polishing up their resume and they're sending it out. And they're going to your competitor. 
and they are enlivening and energizing your competitor who's more progressive than you are and grants more decision-making autonomy at the edge, like the, like the U.S. military has been teaching for 10 years, okay, about complex endeavor spaces. Mm -hmm. Number one thing that's happening, according to this theory, is there's a rotation of talent that's being triggered and prompted by crappy transformational change. The best people leave because they're like, you know what? This is not for me anymore and I'm gone. See you later. And they go to a competitor who is more enlightened and they bring their energy there. So what's happening is the best companies and the best people are finding each other and that's leaving everyone else behind in a ghetto. And a ghetto of what? Of B players, C players, D players, bad process, external consultants, all kinds of nonsense, Isn't it? right? None of the good people, none of the good people stay there. I want to say one more thing about the top talent and then you tell me what you think about what I just said, okay? The top talent, here's the proof they're the top talent. They have options and they can exercise them, okay? Other people don't have the career range that the top talent does. The top talent has options and they'll exercise and that's exactly what they do. So this is one of the, I think maybe the evolutionary purpose of this crappy agile that's going around is to dislodge and relocate the best talent where they can actually re get purpose and meaning from in a more progressive organization that understands agency. Okay. So this is like bottom line. It's come back to the fact that we need to eat. So right. Great ideas, great system. Because when, when we say it's all self-organized and open, this is the natural way of interacting between each other and improving ourselves and also the collective of our business organization and even uh, the, the civil. Because for me right now with this agile renaissance or next level agile, it's taking what we've learned and business agility and put it across the society because we need to have I think if we want to go to a decentralized way of interacting between each other, because I think this, this crisis we are in or kind of still in, depending on where you are in the world, has showed us all of these aspects. But at the, at the end of the day, whether it's the consulting industrial complex of agile or even any other industry, people want to sell because they want to, to earn money, scale their business and then eat. So as long as you have this kind of dynamic and the top talent, as you said, like they don't care because they will be, they could jump from a country to, or to another. Yeah, the best talent, yeah. they'll go to the best companies. No, I'm talking about the employees. The best employees will go, will leave and go to the best companies. Yeah. Um, and the best companies now in, the, in this post COVID hybrid space are now recruiting far more widely than they were before. They're recruiting all over the world. So what this is going to do is make the best companies better and the worst companies are going to be worse as the top talent goes to the top companies and all that's left is people who don't, you know, they're kind of just not if super effective. Um, but this is what's going to happen. And yeah. I'm connecting to that with this uh, article because Steve Denning with Radical Management and he says like, uh, is that a question just of being agile and all this fluffy uh, DevOps integration and blah, blah, blah. He says like exactly that. So if you, if you don't learn lesson from this crisis and the crisis, I don't remember if it's in Latin or ancient Greek, but it's a kind of a, it's a filter, right? a crisis filter things. Uh, so, and he says, survive me, I prefer to say try. Those who understand this component of being open and self-managed and truly make an effort to have an employee, stakeholders and customer experience that will reach something like meaningful for everyone. And to give you a practical example, since March, 2020, at the beginning of this, a lot of teams of my client asked me, could we uh, do um, working agreement with, because there was like telling like, everybody is, you talk about hybridization of uh, remote work and working in the office. Five clients of mine, they decide 
Okay, there's three in the United States, two here in Canada. They have decided together not to renew their commercial lease and take on only uh, some uh, renting space to go meet for some specific event and ceremony once a while in their iteration. And they are decided okay. in, for the rest of their life at this enterprise. So what, what, the, are there part of those who will thrive more and they will be attracting these uh, top talent? Because you could work actually, you could work in a co-working space if you'd like to go out of your home or you could stay home. So there's no kind of, just the way to work together. It's not enforced. They let them decide, and they ask me as a coach to facilitate those working agreement session, team agreement session, of how they want to do this, with a visualization like a business model canvas, and and they do this, and I like it, because it was like a ask from developers or people working there, and so there was a great collaboration. So it's happening, but is it? Do you think it's? Yeah, going yeah, to yeah. Totally. So now let's talk about what has to be true for uh, any progress to actually take place. Okay. Yeah. All right, let's talk about progress in general. Just pro like, how do you get some progress? Like if we look at uh, the agile space, um, the agile space supposedly preaches a gospel of continuous improvement, mm -hmm. but I haven't actually seen any, I haven't seen any improvement in the agile space for like 10 years. Have you? Not really. I mean, DevOps kind of. Not an analytic way. Think about it. I mean, what I see is more. Okay, so let's say let's sell bullshit. So a church. So a church that sells that that has a dogma of continuous improvement doesn't actually do it. All right. So it's a it's there's some hypocrisy there. All right. So, but wait wait a minute. Movement isn't in the transformations. It's in the transactions. The agile industry might be optimized on transactions. And by that measure, there's been a lot of progress, wouldn't you say? Because you could measure the in the transaction in the transaction department, it's been a stunning, stunning progress in the past 10 years. Right? Constance. The, because yeah. do you have an example or sure, go ahead. No, I mean, do you, oops, do you have a... Um... Yeah, well, I'm going somewhere. I'm going somewhere with the thought. Uh, let me go to the next place, okay? Okay. So the Agile world, this is this is a Venn diagram with four things in it, right? First is practices, right? And it's over here is values and principles from the manifesto, right? Mm -hmm. There's some overlap between values and principles. I don't know what to call this, but there's something there, right? And then, you know... Values inform principles. Principles inform patterns, not practices. Okay, so practices are informed by patterns. This is the missing link. This is where we're going to improve is by generating patterns of interaction that are better, uh, you know, to, to support these principles that supports these values. Okay, so patterns of interaction, several things about them. Practices are rigid. Patterns are flexible, right? So any practice that that implement that expresses this pattern is okay with me, okay? So you're seeing around the whole uh, community and industry an acknowledgement that patterns is the new game, practices is yesterday's game, exactly. okay? Patterns prov patterns provide much more flexibility for implementation, okay? So um, you know I. Um, and I'm a managing uh, member of this thing called uh, uh, Open Leadership Network. Mm -hmm. And we have a set of patterns. And here's what those patterns are. The keystone pattern is invitation, invitational leadership or leadership invitation. In other words, yes, we still delegate. Yes, we still name or impose direction. Yes, we still name or impose some reasonable constraints but we also mix in some invitation into those delegations so that we're get, we're triggering engagement on the part of the people. Okay. Yeah. Now these other seven uh, patterns, they support this pattern. Yeah, right. Yeah. So let's just go all the way around clarity of authorization. If you don't know what you're being invited into, how can you ever know uh, you need clarity of authorization to decide? Otherwise you can't, if you, if you delegate to me, but you don't delegate decision-making authority, 
I'm I that's a no win for me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Second thing is scaling's a coordination problem. Coordination problems are solved through interaction protocols, and we saw this in the military diagram I showed earlier. Mm -hmm. Okay. Empirical approach, that's all of Agile, the empirical approach. Now let's go the other way. Explicit agreement. Most companies don't know what teams, executives, and departments, and groups that work together agree on at all. It's all vague. Nobody knows what they're talking about in terms of, when you ask them, what are your explicit agreements? Can you name some? Nobody can tell you. No. Okay. And, the, and of course, the, the management of boundaries around decision rights is very, very important. Now, hold on. I'm almost finished. Then you can go... Whole group processes like open space, get the whole system in the room to tap the collective intelligence of the crowd and to surface the best ideas. And that builds common knowledge, mm. common knowledge. Okay. Now common knowledge is used to coordinate very large groups of people, even societies and civilizations. And I can put a book, uh, I can put a book in the chat that explains all this, a, a link to an Amazon book called a rational ritual. But those eight patterns, they fit here, okay, right here. Mm -hmm. They're the bridge between principles and practices, patterns, okay? So these patterns or interaction are the ones that win the game. These are the ones that have to be taught to executives. Yeah, leave, leave it there, please, because I'd like, I'd like okay. to pick your, uh, your brain on this because I've seen it before. I think all of these patterns is something that I – try my best to sometimes comprehend and implement without having yep. to explain their pattern beside practice. Because for me, the way I see it is having those sets of values and principles, it should be a kind of a, a way of to help leaders making decisions. So when you have patterns, because for me, patterns like boundary management, for, for instance, what will be the, the pattern here that will help a team or an organization to actually... So the boundaries is what? Because explicit, explicit agreement, we see the lack of it, even like between contract, right? This oh. is the boundary management stuff. Imagine inside these circles, it's a domain of decision-making, okay? If it's too tight and you can't make any decisions that affect your work or very few, a guy like you is just going to quit, okay? Because you're too constrained, too much command control, not enough room of movement, okay? Over here, there's too much space for the typical person. Maybe not for you, but for most people. Now, everything's a decision. Everything's a negotiation. There's too much space for movement. So every that's a lot of waste with this too much deciding about deciding, okay? But here is some middle ground, not too tight, not too loose, okay? Here's the boundary, but inside you have some freedom of movement, okay? This is an enabling constraint, right? So the boundary management in this diagram refers to when people try to breach this boundary, executives need to rein them in and say, no, nope, that's outside the boundary. But they need to okay? they... stay inside. That's need to yeah. be upon the, the organization and the team and that they push those kind of values and they accept that they could delegate stuff. So because for me, yeah. this is connected, right? It's interconnected. It's all, yeah. These patterns are all a system. Like in isolation, each one of them is not going to completely work. But together as a group, they're going to work really well. These patterns are part of uh, what you call the open leadership network. That's the correct. <laughs> yeah. So the open leadership network is, uh, um, so you, you know. Open leadership network.com. I'm talking to my uh, audio podcaster right now that they don't see this beautiful graph. And again, if you want That's to right. come in our YouTube channel, and anyways, uh, for my podcaster, I will put the link on all of these websites that Daniel and I were talking about if you'd like to go further in that. Because we try to enable people not just to think, but to see that what the mistake are we doing as a community of agile people or lean people, whatever. I, 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 I'm, I'm The skipping. number one... The, the number, pardon me, the number one problem in the, the organizational chain space, which includes agility, is that executives are not being taught that employee engagement is essential to any lasting change. 
okay? Most of the frameworks and most of the people selling stuff in the Agile space, framework-wise, here's what they say. Do the framework and the engagement is going to be great. Just do the framework. Everything's going to be good. No. So they, it doesn't work that way. How those people try to sell you this system? They're going to save the day, you know? And, and for me, like probably this mantra of continuous um, improvement we talked before, it's, it's maybe a kind of this paradox that, like, oh, we, we want to do this because maybe as a consultant, I will not be able to clearly use the empirism of something. So maybe a lot of people, because they don't know what they're talking about, they don't even know what they suggest to do to uh, leaders and so on, or teams. So they call it continuous improvement. But actually, as you mentioned, we cannot measure the improvement. So this is why when I used to work in large scale organization that they want to have a business transformation or even a digital transformation using the agile mindset, we did a kind of a survey at the beginning, not a big two, three weeks assessment, but at least we want to see where they are. We take a picture of where they are with their interaction. And it's 10 domains that include communication, decision making and everything. And so we, we surveyed them for this. And then after we implement the agile ways and new patterns, we're going to survey again yep. if we have something. So, but I see a lack of this kind of process and interaction in our industry. There's not a lot of doing this because the leaders, well, I don't want to spend too much money on it. Just give me, give me the agile, give me the DevOps, give me the Kanban. So like agile is not a thing you buy. It's a thing to inspire people to work better and most of us oh, you can you can you can buy it you can buy it but before uh you buy it as an executive um you're going to need an education so here let me give you an example a bottom line example for your readers for your listeners okay um i worked for a fellow in the boston area worked for a public company software company uh just got purchased by microsoft And um, they wanted to roll out Scrum across their 900 person engineering organization. They had 14 leaders running this 900 person global group distributed all over the world. Okay. They had people in India, people in Europe and so forth, America, right? Um, what basically happened was I said, look, you want to, you want to roll out Scrum? You want to use Scrum across the company, different flavors of Scrum? Yeah, we want that. All right. Then before I can help you, I told him, I want to meet with the leadership team and I want to go through things that the scrum guide actually says. And I want you guys to score your personal support for the statement in the scrum guide and what you think the leadership team's current support is for it. And let's have that conversation and let's compare our grades and see what the leadership team thinks about what we're going to have to do to support the scrum. Okay. Well, we had very many awkward conversations around that. We met on Tuesdays and Thursdays for one hour at 7 a.m. That was the one time everyone could meet. We met for one hour at a time. We met five or six times. We went all the way through about 20 statements in the scrum guide. We did these ratings and scorings. And at one time, at one point in the conversation, An executive who had very much, who I knew had the respect of the rest of the leadership team, he clear wrote and he spoke up. He came, in, he came in a little bit to the camera and he said, listen, I don't think we can do this. We're not set up this way. It's not our culture. Um, if what it's going to take to do this means that we have to support the statement right here. And it was the one about the product owner being one person. He's like, I don't think we can do it. And I, I just let the, that statement hang in the air for, for several seconds, like maybe 30, 40 seconds. And then this woman spoke up, the only woman on the leadership team. She, she spoke up. She said, listen, I've been working here for a year and a half, but I come from this other company, you know, and she named it. She said, we did exactly what Daniel's suggesting here. And it was a little painful. It was a little awkward. It was a little difficult at first. But once we figured it out, we accelerated. And a lot of good things happened. And we had happy 
happier customers and better products. So I think we can do this. It's just a question to do this thing. And those are the conversations that are not taking place in the agile space today. What's taking place, what's going on in the agile space is it's going to be so great. We're going to do A, we're going to do B, we're going to do C. And when you get to like, you know, uh, level, camp level three, you know, you've arrived. And it's going to be so effing great. And oh, and here, here's where you sign here. Sign here. Yeah, sign here. It's a, it's a yeah, sign of the buy-in. Huh? Are we buy-in? Huh. We... No, this is not. I mean, I, for me, maybe I'm. I don't believe in luck, because I believe more in choice. The choice we made and everything, but it's a. It makes me smile right now because I agree with you. But it's not because I want to be agreeable. It's because I just saw like it's common sense. And if we stop. All right. So let's talk about this. Yeah. 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 So how do we generate progress? Okay. Here's how we're going to generate progress. Number one, we're going to promote and expand and spread the idea that employee engagement is essential in any lasting change. Okay. Because right now the agile industry is not promoting that as a theme or a meme at all. In fact, nobody wants to have the engagement conversation, even though there's a mound of data that supports isn't it, isn't employee it engagement. Core, isn't it at the core of the movement? Yeah, yeah, it's the core of the movement as well. But not only that, but even if it isn't the core of the movement, there's a mound of data from the Gallup organization, gallup.com, that's, that, that, that correlates yes. every good outcome you're looking for with engaged people, Okay. So if you don't engage the people, you have no shot at transformation whatsoever. Okay. Everybody, everybody who's buying transformation needs to learn that. And the day that that happens is the day that the BS will be greatly reduced because it opens the question, well, what would we do to engage the people? Oh, do we just do the framework? Does that actually work? No, it doesn't. What does work? Um, inviting, inviting participation, inviting the best ideas, creating space for people to speak their minds so that the, the best idea can see the light of day, getting people in one room so they can actually, um, <laughs> so they can actually have a conversation about what's going to work. Here's a, here's a, here's a picture from an open space event. This is only like one tenth of the people that are in this open space. It's a session and it's like about 40 people are here. And this is an example of how the best idea sees the light of day, okay? There's another session over in that corner. You can see it. Yep. And this session's all over the building. This is how we actually get it done, okay? We're going to get it done by inviting people in. Executive leaders retain decision rights, but, but invite people to influence decisions. And then we get to see like what the group's ready to do, what the group can do in the next 90 days. And we go and we execute on that in 90 day waves of change. That's the way to go. And that's where we need to get to. You, you talk about 90 days? Yeah. So yeah, it's about 30, 60, 90 days uh, to actually measure the progress. Yeah, yeah. You could do it in as little as 45 days, you know, but let's, let, let's talk about iteration for a minute. So, go ahead. I just have a question here because I, For me, the first time I was introduced to kind of an open space uh, with a big telecom company here in Canada, I, I found it was great. People were interacting together. They were influencing each other. And we put a lot of things visual to have takeaways and make it happen into the 30 days kind of um, iteration that you're going to talk about after. But for me, I was a bit like after those three months, I saw that people have returned to their way of doing things. And this has became just a side project of implementing nope. people's values. Nope. Well, nope. that, that, that's because that's because leaders need to understand about boundary management and clarity of authorization ah. and explicit agreements. If you keep those, this invitation stuff isn't simple, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got to be, you've got to have more. Let, let's talk about design thinking for a minute. Everyone talk, wants, you know, design thinking is great. Design thinking is beautiful. Stanford University design thinking, blah, 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 blah. But what's the risk? Hey, if you're, if you're a leader, I want you to use design thinking 
but I want you to use it in game design because that's what that's what this agile transformation thing actually is. It's game design. So how are you going to invite people to play the game of changing? Okay. And you're going to do it by being really clear in what you're inviting them into. It's not like a delegation. With a delegation, you can be sloppy about it. So for example, I can delegate responsibility to you without authority. That's sloppy. But it, it goes on in, all over the world all the time. A good leader will delegate responsibility and authority on a good day. That's what happens, right? But with an invitation, there's so much more to it. You have to clearly describe what's in it for the person. Like, what's the goal? Number two, what are the constraints or rules? Okay, this is another property of a good game. The third thing is, how are people going to track their progress as they move towards the goal? The feedback mechanisms, right? Like, like a burn down chart or whatever. The, the goal has to be really clear, as you saw. Yeah, in yeah, yeah. So that this is why this is why leadership invitation requires um, knowledge and skill in these broad areas. Okay, all this stuff has to be very, very well understood by the leader before they can issue a good invitation. And the fact that those patterns are in circles because they could circulate, lead their way to yeah. Kind of That's right. That's right. Because you don't want to uh, just turn around and make it step by step. You just want like, you need yeah. all of these pattern agreed before moving on, isn't it? That's right. So how much more time do we have? About 10 minutes, I will say. All right. So so 10 minutes more. So, you know, I'll the openleadershipnetwork.com. Uh, people can go there and they can learn about courses that are scheduled uh, in the current month and a couple of months out. They can also read the course descriptions there, openleadershipnetwork.com. Right. And they can also learn about these techniques, right? So we actually have a class in the eight patterns where we go deep on the eight patterns. So, And we give you tools that you can use to teach executive leadership how to do this. Also included in that class is a checklist of uh, executive readiness to support Scrum. So you, you take this checklist, you bring it to the leadership team, you work it out with them. We, it has all quotes from the scrum guide and they learn what it takes to support the scrum. Otherwise, if you don't want to support the scrum, let's not even do it. And I've had that happen a couple of times. People realize, oh shit, if we implement scrum, it means this. Oh, we don't want to do that. Okay, great. You just saved yourself, you know, 300,000 bucks. Find it. You can find a better way. And this is like really the best value when we talked about like investment and return on investment. Yeah. So and, and, and by the way, uh, Daniel, uh, so the best website to see your work, is it the open leadership network.com or is the other one inviting leadership.org, I think? Because which? Um, well, there's several, there's several webs for, that you can get me. That if you want to, if the people just want to get me and then get to all the webs and get me, get, get access to my email. Just go to danielmezik.com, first name, last name.com. And then everything is there. Perfect. So that's kind yeah. of the question because, and for your training, because actually uh, me, uh, I, I thought it was like uh, last uh, summer. I'm not, no, it's not last summer. But anyway, there was a training um, that same interesting about like teaching and to this age of digital, you have somewhere I saw. Could you talk a little bit about this one? You know, like um, a lot of people say, oh, yes, we are doing uh, virtual training now with Zoom or Teams and blah, blah, blah. But uh, you said like they're not. And I think you have a no, not. No, 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 no. Yeah, look, look here, I'm just going to make the point to you, okay? I'm going to just, I'm just going to make the, I'm going to make the point to you right now. I'm just going to, I'm just going to emphasize a point. All right, look, look, here's the reality of it all. I, you can connect with people over this medium if you know what you're doing. Okay. And then there's a book that was written by a guy named John Nace, but he wrote a book called Megatrends. In that book, he coined the term high tech, high touch. Mm -hmm. Basically, he said, the more you depend on and use technology, the more you have to incorporate the human factor in the connection. Or, or we, we're just going to isolate each other with technology. It's not going to be good. The more tech you use, the more you have to pay attention to the human factors and human experience. Okay. So I want you to notice something right there. 
I'm fading away from the camera right now, but I, I came in quite close to the camera. In fact, I looked right at the camera and you probably had the sense that I was talking directly to you. Yes. And looking at the and I, and I use my hands, right? Okay, so this new hybrid world is creating opportunities for people to step in and step up by taking advantage of what the medium offers. So we teach a class called How to Teach Online where all the stuff is explained. Okay, now I am descended from a race of giants. Like I am almost 6'5". Wow. And I leverage that height and as I go about my business in the world, because height is a factor that uh, shows up as part of your persona. Yeah. But guess what? And this is especially good for the sh people that are shorter um, and or women. OK. Um, the camera now allows you to nullify the height advantage. If you are four foot two, this medium is totally for you. OK, because you can be super effective in this medium, as effective as this guy that's six five, by just knowing what you're doing when you're making a point in front of the camera. OK, so we teach this stuff and it's a this is a whole new world. And the people that are uh, making progress in their careers in the hybrid world are mastering the video communication skills that they need to be perceived as a good communicator and as a good leader. This is what's going on today. Certain people are vaulting forward who are getting this, okay? And the rest are just treating TV like radio. Yeah, they're just, they're just reacting between those who take action and try to make it. All right, so, so like, uh, as you just mentioned, the importance of using a medium and be authentic and be ourselves. And so you could teach some technique to be more even engaging into this virtual kind of training. That's correct. Might be the last thing even after this crisis. And that's yeah, correct. Even before the crisis, as I work internationally, I'm not always taking a plane. So I was already an hybrid of trying to perform coaching, consulting and training online. Uh, but I will tell you the truth, even if I'm uh, an average uh, five foot eight, I kind of, <laughs> I kind of miss meeting people in person. Oh, of course. Yeah. And, and not, you know, anyone who is um, of average height or, or below uh, can do certain things uh, to, you know, uh, show up as a leader. We also teach a, cl a class called acting as an executive coach. I teach it with a guy named Peter Fishbach. Oh. And in that class, we teach acting in a role. Like this guy's, a, this guy's a classically trained actor with like 12 years of acting and teaching acting experience. And, and I teach client and coach psychology. And, you know, there's certain things about executives you need to know. And one of them is they have a nonverbal language. Mm -hmm. we, we teach that nonverbal language uh, in the class. Um, and because if you don't pick up the signals... And then they know that you're not picking up the signals, then you don't know the language. Okay. You need to understand the language. So we teach this so we can influence executives. Okay. But, um, you know, Danielle, about these things, uh, because my mom was a psychologist. So I kind of, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, neuro linguistic programming and stuff like this. And sometimes for me, as an I, I, I don't hide it, I'm an hypersensitive. Uh, what we call in French, something like more like, oh, in English, I think the term is high performance individual or intellectual. So I'm always very sensitive to my environment and the people. Yes. Like even yesterday in a training, I saw someone who was like, so, so I kind of, when the people was explaining the things finished, I said like, oh, what about you, Fred? Is that because I saw like, uh, you seems to be disagreeing, like, uh, is it about the principle or something? So, but, but at the meantime, when you talked about like um, knowing the executive nonverbal language or communication, both sides for me, uh, I don't mind learning these things or seeing people, but at some point it's aggravating when I see people doing it to me. And uh, oh, yeah, so, and I'd like to be just what you see is what you get, being my authentic self. And I don't want to please everyone. 
So at the end of the day, I kind of, I will tell you frankly, I don't care of all these neuro-linguistic or body language things. It's not necessarily true because people could be into reaction of, and, and if I am in a space where there's a lot of those people watching me and saying like, oh, his eyes doing this, so it's mean that. No, it's not. <laughs> There, well, it's all in it's all in context. There's a science behind that, but uh, I mean, I wasn't in a boardroom once, and I'm not someone who was like uh, necessarily chilly, but I was chill. So I crossed my my arm like this, and of course, the HR person said, "Oh, Alexandre is not is not open." It has nothing to do about openness or closingness. I mean, well, that's just that's just that's just an amateur that doesn't understand context, right? So I mean, that person's totally missing the boat. But how about this one? How about this one? Okay. People in general, when they have mixed feelings, uh, it's a pretty good tell uh, that they have mixed feelings and aren't sure and aren't decided and might not be agreeing with you if they touch any part of their head. If people touch their head in general, that is a very clear nonverbal signal of uh, mixed feelings and, and potentially non-alignment on, on what's being said. Okay. So for something else, like I don't know. No, there's there's something people will touch their head before they cite an objection, for example. Right. Here's another one. Have you ever talked to an executive or been trying to talk to an executive and they're looking away while you're talking to them? They're doing something else, me even. Oh yeah. Like, yeah. All right. All the time. When I right. it, like they want to, to have my, my input, like they don't, and they will even give you like the time box thing. We have five minutes and they don't even look at you. They don't like, they do something else. And then of course, sometimes the assistants come in and make them sign something. Yeah. I'll okay. Let, let me put it, let me put it, let me go another way now. Have you ever dealt with an executive who said, we have five minutes, show me what you got. And they give you their full attention for the full five minutes. Yes. And when the five minutes is up, you're yeah. dismissed. Yeah. Okay. That's that's a more enlightened leader. That's a conscious leader. Okay. So there's this nonverbal language. Uh, you know, we teach it in the class. When here's the bottom line. If I'm talking and the executive looks away, I stop talking. Until they give me their attention again. And they might say, Oh, please keep going. You know, I'm doing something else, but keep going. So no. This is important for your goals. I, I can come back later. Yeah. And this will actually help a lot. I don't know how much more time we have, but I can tell you a quick story about this. I'll, uh, I'll tell you, like, the funny thing, Daniel, is I, I smile because I, it's remind me of one of my colleagues. She uh, sometimes, when that happened to her, she will say a phrase or a word that have nothing to do with the conversation. Well, that's because... Verify if they were listening or paying attention. And uh, yeah. most people, when they ask questions, they're asking questions to confirm what they already know, not to learn something new. Yeah. So they want your yes or no to confirm their model of reality, right? Someone who really wants to learn asks a question, which if they get the quote wrong answer, it, it destroys their model of reality and causes them to have to refactor everything they're thinking. That's that's a real that's a real learner, that kind of person. Yeah, right? exactly. Because uh, when they say, oh, if you ask a question, uh, you, you demonstrate that you, you want to learn. Well, not really. Because what, not really. what is your intention behind it? And uh, like Isaac Asimov uh, put in his book, I Robots, I don't know if you remember, if you read it, it's one of my favorite books. I guess at some point, like there's like this detective that came up to the crime scene and they have these kind of devices that uh, they could ask questions. But yeah some point the hologram of the disease says like no oh, you don't ask the right question <laughs> so <yeah. laughs> and, it's always about the right questions you know right question. we, um, um, when you have a trainer who says like oh there's no stupid question yes it's to make people at ease and that's okay and of course you better if you want to learn that's a question but what was the intention behind so there's a right question i'm sorry there's no stupid question that's right but there's the right question and i think a good trainer will say like, excuse me, that this is out of context or the, why asking it in some, some ways that you will get what you're looking for? I don't know. Because well, I want your people to know. I want your people to know if they ever attend a class that I teach, 
I will always address their question at some level of depth and I will never ever park your question. Ah, that's a I'm great just not gonna do it. I'm not gonna do it because when my question gets parked, I feel managed and also uh, controlled. Like if, I, if I'm in your class and I ask a question, and I'm paying good money to come to your class and I haven't asked a lot of questions yet. I want my fucking question answered. Pardon my French. You're on the there real agile. We could dare about these, no problem. But the, 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 <laughs> I mean, like, especially in the context of uh, paid training, professional training. Yeah. Uh, asking a question like, you, you don't do that. You, you go through it, even if it's take more time. But again, I think it's our duty as a consultant and coach to also help them going through the intention or the purpose of what is going on in the context of either a training or a scaling. Yeah, yeah. So let me let me tell you my let me tell you my my quick story. Sixty seconds on this executive, yeah, right? All right, guy's name is Jake. Really smart guy. Learns really fast. Kind of a command and control guy, but really got the open stuff really quick. I'm coaching him. I'm working for him. We've got a good, I'm, I'm, I'm functioning as a trusted advisor. We've set up that, that, that relationship. You know, I'm not the hired help. He trusts me. And uh, I'm talking and, and he, uh, I'm, a lot of times executives, when you teach them something, they might not get it the first time. You have to repeat yourself, as you know. Mm -hmm. So I repeat, I repeat some essential lesson to him and, and he looks away. And of course, when executives look away, I stop talking. So this happens several times where he looks away and I realize it's always when I'm repeating something that I've already explained to him one time. So we're at lunch one day and I said, Jake, you know, I noticed every time, uh, every time I repeat myself, uh, you look away. He goes, and he's putting, he's shoving food in his mouth. And he goes, yeah, he goes, that's because every single time that uh, I look away, you stop talking. <laughs> Is that great? It's great. <laughs> like, at least you've been both transparent and telling yeah. me. Yeah. So you have that technique and he has also like, okay, so that's. <laughs> But I wasn't ready for him because he's such a fast learner. He always got it the first time I told him and, and, and he got, he got, he got, uh, this, uh, he lost patience with the repeating. It's like he, I, he was teaching me. You don't have to repeat it to me. I like that. I get it the first time you tell me. I, I'm sure I will have the pleasure to work with you uh, in some kind of... I hope so. I, I really like uh, working with you, like uh, either at the client or whatever, if we'd like to co-create something. And even we could invite a, a bunch of our uh, Enterprise Crown family. There's some good bunch in there. Uh, not everyone. I won't name anyone here on the goods or the bad, but anyway. Yeah. Well, the, uh, the Open Leadership Network is going to be doing a conference on invitation-based change, right? Oh. And, and maybe what we can do is we can invite you in there and you can, you can explain some of your heresies, some of your <laughs> tools and techniques, um, some of your surprising philosophies, and uh, you know, maybe even reveal some of the secret sauce about how you do what you do. I don't know. I don't have any secret sauce. I'm not Colonel Sanders uh, with uh, the fried chicken, but... Uh... Right now, what I do since my exile in Mexico last year, and I just returned now to Canada for a few, uh, few weeks, and I'm going back, mm -hmm. I hope to, to be accepted to uh, work and live as a consultant, of course, in Arizona or Florida. I don't know yet which one to pick. But it's okay. But uh, for me right now, I'm really uh, into bringing uh, the agile ways, let's call it like this, with the equation I made from, for me, it's clear that 2001, the manifesto was a, a cry like uh, some of the co-signatory that I met, they told me we needed to make noise. And unfortunately that year, 9-11 happened. So the noise kind of been diffused a little bit. So that's why a lot of people say, oh, 20 years old, Agile is dead. No way. It's just the beginning of it right now, especially because, you know, 2001, you have the manifesto and the crisis. 2009, you have the blockchain protocol revolution and a crisis because the last pandemic, by the way, of H1N1 and the financial crisis that created the Bitcoin. Exactly. I love it. For my, for my listener, you don't see it, but it's about the graph of Stacy complexity graph from bore, boring to chaos. Exactly. 
So you see the VUCA, it's always there, like a... it's always there. Yeah. Think about think about this, man. Think about like the American Civil War. Mm. Chaos. Chaos. Think about this. Uh the Spanish flu, right? And in, in uh, you know, that that preceded the roaring twenties, right? Yes, what about that? After another World War One. Then the, the that's why they call in the 1920s the world Listen, listen. I'm reading a concise history of the, the 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 Roman Empire. You know what? Every single day, people are trying to answer two questions. Where can I get enough food to eat? And who's trying to kill me? Every single day. People living like animals. Where can I get some food? Who's trying to kill me? And then if I've got the food and the kill me question figured out, um, where can I find uh, uh, a female to have some, you know, a breeding opportunity, right? Before I die, basically, right? That was it. I mean, people have to be agile every single freaking day just to survive. Okay, so this agile stuff, it's not a new invention. The new invention is Jeff Sutherland and some of the others, Ken Troy, the others, they figured out empirical process control works good in complex domains like software development, okay? So they implied empiricism, the software development, we called it agile. All they did was take the empirical approach and point it at software dev. That's it, period. So, you know, like think about like immigrants to Canada when they came over from Europe, do you think they had to uh, exhibit any agile behaviors? Uh, yeah, like every single day to survive. So, you know, this and, idea that agile is some novel thing. You know, I know, that's what I said. Like, and, and sometimes, and, and all the thing that I, the, spend I spend, uh, the time I spent in Tulum lately with these lab of uh, decentralized finance, these guys, they don't know shit about Scrum or Kanban or DevOps or what have you. But all of these blockchain programmer or any other stakeholders that part of this project of decentralized finance, they are doing what a lot of people say they do here up north, but they don't. So they're doing it intuitively. So they came up to, ah, oh, I have an idea. Could we do this like this? And I don't know. This is for me the true agile. Of course. And you don't drop Let's you don't drop name about they are doing this and that and me as their coach i just encourage them to continue and test it like okay yes that's sabrin sabrin have a great idea so let's work with octavio on that and then you do the sprint review and they don't know they do a sprint review to see if this id was the good one or not and it's not about the product review it's about like I should have said the retrospective, my bad, sorry. The, the retrospective about the process they do, but because at some yeah. point, we are not doing the pure kind of scrum by the book. It's like, I know it's, it's, it's gonna be an anti-pattern here, but for them, they were constructing something tangible with a process. So they kind of mingled the, the review of their process product and also the process of the pattern they were to try to implement. So this is why I know a scrum master should not mix review and retrospective but in my openness i let them go having this ceremony at kind of the same time because it's touched intrinsically it's an intersection of the product and the process and their case in their particular context but please all of those they're real agile listener i know i'm not saying that the review and the retrospective should be together but in their context it kind of and we don't call it a retrospective review they were just inspect and adapt what they did and what they proposed at the beginning of the sprint, and they don't even come. Totally. Yeah. So we're almost out of time now, right? Uh, but we kind of, uh, I will say, like we could finish up on this. So if you, if you have any other thoughts, otherwise, yeah, I just want to, I just want to, just want to just just focus your people on on one thing right now. Okay. You gotta people have to be engaged for any of this stuff to work. People, listen. Oh, there's one thing you take take away from this talk. It's that. Take that away, okay? okay. And then. If you really want better results, you know, to your listening audience, you're going to have to distribute authority to make decisions because decisions are engaging. Okay. And that's, that's number two. And then number three, when you invite people, 
it puts them on a decision. You get in their head and now they're playing your game. Okay. So executives do some inviting with the delegations. That's going to prompt decisions. If you want great results, you've got to engage the people, spread that idea throughout your company, teach your executive leaders that disengage people don't bring any good results. They never have, they never will. So the main thing you need to figure out is how are we going to engage people? And my answer to that, and I think the answer of a lot of other people around the world right now is we're going to invite people to participate and bring the best they've got. Okay. Every single day to work. That's how you're going to get it done. Great takeaways, Michael. And that makes me think of what is going on right now when we say only those with an agile mindset, and I'm not talking about our agile movement here, agile as an adjective. Only those with the agile mindset will try, or like Steve Denning says, survive, but because that's the thing. Yeah. Whatever we have in the next couple of months, we have to make decision to either stay up edge or leave. And me, I don't want to be too esoteric to close this great conversation out with you. But it made me think for all my experience in the last nine months in Mexico and Costa Rica that I see a lot of people in all walks of life, all ethnicity, all gender, whatever. They don't care about inclusivity. What they care, it's about invitation. They don't want to fit in. They want to be invited and they want to welcome others. That's exactly. Not- and, and the whole world runs on opt-in participation. Remember what remember what Har- what I said earlier in the very beginning. Harrison Owen said, "All systems are self-organizing." Do you realize what that implies? All of them. Agency, agency, agency. And I'm going to leave you with one one thing that uh, we we could have a whole other two-hour conversation on. You've mentioned blockchain and Bitcoin several times during our conversation, Alexander. That fundamentally is about the distribution of decision rights. It's about human agency. It's about peer-to-peer interaction with no middleman. And it's about authorization at the agent level. Okay, no centralized authority in Bitcoin. Okay, so this is a fundamental tension in the world right now. The world is a super hype, hype, um, super volatile, super uncertain place. And there's a push worldwide for the centralization of decision-making authority. And we saw it with the pandemic. It's ex- Complexity science says that's exactly the wrong approach when you're in the chaotic space. When you're in the chaotic space, you're supposed to open up the agency, open up the information flow, open up the patterns of interaction. So there's a huge tension in the world right now between centralization and decentralization of decisions that affect the most people and technology is going to drive it more and more to the individual further and further away from the, from the centralized, you know, authority. And this is why I see uh, more people, uh, they will say awakening, but I don't want to use that term. Is this only people who said, Hey, I come here to experience life and I don't want to be imposed anything. Exactly. This is what we call uh, personal sovereignty. And of course, in this digital world, you need your digital twin to have this digital kind of sovereignty as well, because I'm not talking about the transhumanism. I'm just talking about like, we have an identity on the net, unfortunately, and that that's there to stay at some point, but how do you protect it by being sovereign to yourself and, and, and so on. So Danielle, I hope that we're gonna meet uh, either at the conference. Could you, is it, is it the set date right now, the conference you talked about, are you like to organize? Um, we haven't set the date, but if, if you want, I'll, uh, I'll send it to, to, to you to distribute to your, uh, you know, your list. Yes. Uh, and it promises to be a great conference. We're, we're, we're gonna be doing is showing experience reports of people that have applied the uh, an invitation-based change approach. And they're going to be telling their stories. People who aren't thought leaders now, but probably will be in the future. Excellent. Daniel, yeah. I'm really thankful and grateful when you accept my invitation to be part of this very agile experience and to talk about the real thing, to spark people. I hope like uh, for my jogger out there, because yes, apparently 
they write to me that, oh, we love to run. And now this is a run of one and a half, 90 minutes run. So maybe they will split it in two rounds or three yeah. rounds. Yeah, and that's my good. Joggers, my joggers, like, they seem to learn more, some of them. And there's others on my YouTube channel. They will appreciate it. By the way, we are Friday, June the 25th, here on the premiere on my YouTube channel at Agile Lounge for Business Agility and Conscious Leadership. So that was Daniel Mezik, the great guy. I'm finally meeting you virtually, and I can Thank wait. you. Live long and prosper, my friend. And this is just the beginning, I think, of our interaction, you and I. Beautiful. I hope you're going to see Thank you very much. My pleasure. My pleasure. Now.